Bang, bang. What's going on, guys? Hope you guys are really excited about this interview. I really enjoyed it. I think you will as well. But before we get into that, make sure that you like this video so that more people on YouTube can find it. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel. And don't forget that BlockFi is the sponsor today. They've got three products. You can buy and sell crypto on their crypto exchange. You can deposit crypto and earn up to 8.6% APY in an interest-bearing account. Or you can deposit crypto and take out a US dollar loan against your crypto collateral. You can use the description right here, or you can go to BlockFi.com slash POMP to learn more. All right, let's get into this episode. I hope you guys enjoy this one. All right, guys, bang, bang. I've got Srivatsan here with me. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you so much for having me. It's awesome to be here. For sure. Uh, before we get into the six most legendary trades of all time, uh, I want everyone to just know a little bit more about you. Tell us a little bit about your background, how old you are, and what you spend your day doing. So, uh, my name is Shivatsan. I'm 17 right now. So I sort of got into the world of finance at, uh, at about 13 or 14. So it was basically it was basically sort of an intersection of my interests back then. So I was really interested in economics. Was also really interested in sort of geopolitics and making money as well. So uh, it sort of all intersected. And you know, I started reading about investing, about Warren Buffett, value investing, which is sort of what I which is sort of what I do. So I spend a lot of time looking at annual reports, looking at you know, company numbers, the fundamentals, and so on and so forth. And so, so that's sort of you know, how I got into finance. And uh, I saw, I also run a podcast called Market Champions, which I featured you on. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but I had you on, I believe, about four or five months ago. Um, so that was pretty cool. And you know, yeah, I feature all kinds of traders. You know, people who do equities, people who do you know, currencies and whatnot. Uh, and I spend basically most of my day, number one, doing my regular school stuff and then looking at, you know, annual reports, interviewing people and, you know, so on and so forth. So that's sort of what I do. I love it. Uh, I want to bring you on the podcast because you recently tweeted uh, four of the most legendary trades of all time. And then we're going to add two more for uh, for this episode. Uh, but maybe let's just start with the first one. Uh, you said George Soros and the Bank of Eng- England and breaking the pound. Maybe tell us that story real quick. Absolutely. So that's that's probably the single most legendary trade of all time. Uh, pretty much, you know, everyone who works on Wall Street has, uh, probably knows this story really well. So back then, and before now, before this trade, Soros was not actually you know, very well known. He's the, he was not as well known as he is today. So back then, there was this exchange rate mechanism. So what what it basically did was it said that you know, the pound has to trade between. 2.78 Deutschmarks and 3.13 Deutschmarks. And, you know, back then in Germany, uh, the currency was Deutschmark and not the euro as it is today. And so after the reunification of Germany, so when Eastern, East Germany and West Germany, uh, you know, they reconciled and they reunited, uh, the, the, the German the central bank raised interest rates all the way up because they were scared that, you know, they're going to see a lot of inflation. And at the, at the same time, the UK economy was actually in recession which means that the right policy in uh, the UK would be to have lower rates so that you know, it stimulates growth and whatnot. But what ended up happening was the Bank of England uh, had to actually maintain uh, you know, this, uh, this band or this trading band so that the, uh, because when you have lower interest rates, what happens is your currency goes lower. When you have higher interest rates, your currency goes higher. And so since Germany had really high interest rates, their currency was all the way at the top of the band. So it was rising against the pound. And so what Soros thought was that eventually Britain would have to reduce rates so that they're able to get out of this recession. And when they do reduce rates, um, Britain would uh, would eventually see the pound fall out of the exchange rate mechanism. And to add to this, number one, uh, the president of the Bundesbank, the German central bank, said that you know the pound could come under pressure and could possibly be devalued. So you know that sort of added to the bearish sentiment. Another thing was that. The, the chief of the BOE at that time, I can't remember his name right now, but he said that he was going to spend about $15 billion defending uh, the Great British Pound and defending this exchange rate mechanism. And Soros thought to himself, hey, that's the exact amount of pounds that I was going to sell. So Soros himself wanted to sell about 15 billion pounds, uh, $15 billion worth of pounds. So the person who actually found this trade was Stanley Druckenmiller, who, who used to work for Soros at the time, and you know, funny enough, the story goes that you know Stanley Schuckenmiller had found this uh, had found this trade, and he 
uh, walks into Soros's office and he tells Soros about it. And uh, Soros looks at him so, uh, you know, sort of so menacingly, you know, Stanley Druckenmiller thought that Soros was just about to rip apart his entire thesis. And what ended up happening was Soros said that this was a once in a lifetime bet. And while Stanley Druckenmiller had about uh, $1 billion worth of, you know, position on it, Soros told him we, uh, he had to 10x that to 10 billion to 15 billion. And they spent a lot of time actually just sitting there selling the pound to whoever would buy it. And, you know, this was sort of a once in a lifetime trade. And, you know, you're able to also see that it's a very asymmetric trade. So if the, if, you know, if Stanley Schuckenmiller was wrong and, you know, the ERM was able to continue, the maximum he would lose is whatever the difference is in the band. So it can go higher than whatever the limit on the band is. So there's only a maximum loss there. However, the maximum profit was unlimited because the, uh, because the pound could just collapse and, you know, it could get absolutely destroyed. And, in the and the and in the middle of September 1992, when uh, I believe it's called Black Wednesday happened, um, everyone was just simply trying to sit there selling pounds. And there was a, there's another extremely famous macro trader. His name is Louis Bacon. And on that day, he was able to find you know people to sell uh, people to sell pounds to. But then you know Soros was unable to find people to sell pounds to. And you know he was very very pissed off that you know. Lewis Bacon was able to find people to take the other side of the trade, but he was not. And, you know, that's sort of, and, you know, eventually the UK government and the central bank realized that you know, trying to save uh, the, the exchange rate mechanism was uh, futile and, uh, and the currency would eventually have to be devalued. So eventually they ended up actually devaluing the currency. And, you know, that ended up being one of the most legendary trades of all time. And Soros ended up making about one to one and a half billion dollars in profit. Absolutely insane, right? To not only find the trade, but also to kind of have the courage to uh, to act on it and do it in size and conviction, which mm -hmm. uh, which takes you know what is a a pretty good idea, obviously, uh, and makes it a great trade is because of that courage and conviction they have to act. Another example of this is Paul Tudor Jones in 1987. Uh, he essentially predicted the crash of 1987 and was able to position himself to profit very handsomely from it. Tell us that story. Sure. So Paul Tudor Jones. As we all know, he's a very, very famous trader. Uh, so actually in 1987, what he found out that was that the way the market was moving was actually very, very similar to what was going on in 1929, uh, which was right before the Great Depression. He saw that the correlations between you know, the way price was moving in 1987 versus that in 1929 was actually you know, very, very close. And you know he did a lot of other kind of data analysis. So he sort of looked at brokerage reports, he looked at sales data and whatnot, and he found out that you know, it was very similar uh, when you look at 1929, when you look at 1987, there were, uh, those two, they were extremely similar. And about two weeks before uh, Black Monday happened in October 1987, uh, he started to aggressively short sell uh, the market. He started taking this position before anyone you know, realized that everything was going to go bust. And so the cost is, is usually said to be portfolio insurance. So basically what portfolio insurance does, it, it's sort of like a stop loss. So it says that if the market declines this much, you know, I'm going to well, resell everything. And so there was, so one week before Black Monday, the market was down about 9%. And that sort of triggered every single uh, portfolio insurance model. And so everyone ended up uh, selling uh, their stock. And eventually on the Monday, on Black Monday, uh, the market fell about 22% or so. And uh, on the Friday before Black Monday, after the market closed, uh, Soros actually walked into Stanley Druckenmiller's office. Now, Druckenmiller tells the story to Jack Schrager in the book, The New Market Wizard. So Druckenmiller, who's actually very, very long, so he had a long position. He, he, uh, he made money if, you know, if uh, the market went up, realized that the market was going to collapse after seeing Paul Tudor Jones' study. And on Black Monday, actually, in the morning, there wasn't much of a move. It was kind of flattish. So he was able to flip his position from net long to net short. So he was able to start, he would, he would make money if you know, prices started to collapse. And he ended up making a big profit on Black Monday. And meanwhile, you know, George Soros lost his shirt. Uh, because George Soros was way too big to, you know, to be able to flip his position as quickly as Stanley Schuckenmiller was able to. And, you know, uh, Paul Tudor Jones made about $100 million from this trade. And, you know, you can actually read a lot more about this trade in Sebastian Malaby's book, More Money Than God, which is an excellent book about hedge funds. And there's also a documentary about this that tends to, you know, surface from time to time. 
but you know, usually it's usually taken down immediately. But uh, you know, that's a it's a very exciting documentary, and I've watched it a couple of times. I think you know that's something everyone should watch. Yeah, it's uh, it's an incredible story, especially when you start to realize that a lot of the uh, the legendary macro traders. Uh, they essentially were sharing the trades with each other, right? Mm-hmm. And so uh, not only was it uh, information that could be shared, but two was uh, you had to be able to act uh, and be able to act within a certain time frame uh, and with that conviction again. And so in that situation right. where George Soros uh, was able to break the pounds, but this time he couldn't switch from uh, from long to short, ends up actually hurting him, uh, which is uh, very interesting. Let's talk about uh, the Kiwi dollar trade. Uh, and Andy Krieger, tell us that story. So uh, Andy Krieger was a trader at Bankers Trust, which used to be a bank in New York, but then eventually it, you know, got bought out by Deutsche Bank. So, you know, typically currency traders would take, you know, 20 million, 25 million, that kind of position. But then Andy Krieger will, was actually made out, would take positions that were 10x that, so about 200 to 50 million. And on top of that, Andy Krieger in general was a very, very successful trader. And, you know, his capital limit was about $700 million. And so, you know, the New Zealand dollar was a relatively new currency. And what ended up happening was that the New Zealand dollar rose about 40% against the U.S. dollar from 1986 to uh, 1987. And so Andy Krieger analyzed it and figured out that the New Zealand dollar was extremely overvalued and, you know, it was going to go down. And so when he when he actually showed it, it is a, he shorted it with a massive amount of leverage. So he used about 400 to one leverage. That means that for every dollar he put up, he got to borrow $400 uh, from his broker. And his short on the Kiwi dollars was actually much greater than the money supply of New Zealand. So, which is, which is pretty insane if you think about it, because it's greater than the money supply. So he basically shorted more New Zealand dollars and there are New Zealand dollars. And you know, the finance minister of New Zealand actually called up Andy Krager's boss. Or it is claimed that he called up Andy Krager's boss to say, get the F off our currency, little effort. Uh, and you know, Krager made a massive profit. He made about $300 million on this trade. And you know, needless to say, you know, he went and worked for George Soros, who is pretty much the greatest currency trader to, to ever exist. So I think, so yeah. I think that's a pretty insane story as well. It, it, it's incredible because it basically was like a naked short to some degree, right? Where uh, they were able to short more than the outstanding uh, circulating uh, currency. And so when you start to see this, it's just understanding the imperfections in the market or the opportunities in the market. And again, courage and conviction to act and uh, and, and put the position on, do it in size. Um, and while you're risking capital, if you're right, you end up capturing the reward. Mm-hmm, right. And, you know, Stanley Chuckenville actually makes that point in another interview where he says that, you know, when he went to work for Soros, you know, he thought that he would learn, you know, what drives the euro, what drives the yen, what drives the markets in, you know, Russia. But, uh, you know, but the only thing that he really learned was that, you know, when you know you're right and you're almost 100% sure or sure that you're right, then, you know, you should absolutely bet the house on, you know, whatever bet it is. So, you know, for example, Soros was almost 100% sure that, the, uh, the, you know, the Bank of England would have to uh, pull the pound out of the exchange rate mechanism. So, he went and pretty much bet, uh, bet the entire house. He bet about $10 billion, which is massive. And that's, uh, and you know, that's sort of the major lesson that Stanley Jacques Miller learned when he was at Soros. For sure. Uh, the next story uh, is David Tepper during the global financial crisis uh, and the big banks. Pretty much everyone was uh, fairly concerned about the big banks. Some of them had failed. Uh, there was a concern that there was going to be like the nationalization of banks. But uh, mm-hmm. David Tepper stepped in and tell us this story. Right. So David Tepper in general is sort of a distressed kind of guy, a uh, distressed stuff investor. So, you know, when, uh, when companies are in distress, he tends to go and buy their debt and buy their stocks, especially when the chances of recovery are quite great. And so when he saw, so back in 2008 or nine, during the great financial crisis, everyone thought that the banks would be nationalized just like uh, they were during the great depression. But, you know, the officials had no, you know, they had uh, no reason to, uh, or no intention to actually nationalize the banks. And the government released a white paper called the Financial Stability Plan. And, you know, when Tepper read that, he realized that the banks would have to be saved. And so most people believed the U.S. government wouldn't nationalize the banks, but no, not Tepper. You know, Tepper thought that they would not nationalize the banks. He thought, he thought that the banks would eventually bounce back. You know, Tepper was able to buy Citigroup for about 79 cents, Bank of America for about 372 or so. Um, you know, he, was, he was able to buy a billion dollars worth of commercial, you know, market-backed securities, which are pretty much 
you know, been the cause of the, uh, been the cause of the great financial crisis um, at a ridiculously cheap price. So he paid nine cents on the dollar for every dollar of actual commercial mortgage-backed securities. Now he paid only nine cents for it, and he bought a lot of distressed debt as well. So he was able to find you know companies that were distressed, companies that were you know on the verge of bankruptcy, but and he bought a lot of their debt and. The, the entire trade uh, made $7 billion for his fund, Appaloosa Management, and you know, Tepper, personally, he made about $4 billion. And you know, in my thread, I put that into perspective. So, you know, if Tepper actually worked 24 hours a day for 365 days that year, he would make $457,000 every single hour that he works, which is absolutely insane because, you know, the average American is probably not going to make $457,000 in a year, but he made it. Never, you know, he would make it in a single hour if you if you put that into perspective. So I think that's another extremely insane trade that was made. It's unreal, and David Tepper is no uh, no stranger whatsoever to uh, distressed situations and uh, and kind of fighting to uh, to make sure he right. drives those profits. Uh, another example uh, or great kind of legendary trade is John Paulson with the credit default swaps. Tell us that story. Absolutely. So. Uh, as you all know that, you know, Michael Lewis has written a very famous book called The Big Short, where he talks about, you know, Steve Eisman, Michael Burry, and Jamie Mai, who also bought credit default swaps. So credit default swaps are basically insurance against the collapse of these mortgage-backed securities. And uh, so basically, if you, buy, if you buy insurance, you know, you pay a small premium, but then, you know, when uh, shit hits the fan, you get paid a massive amount, uh, a massive amount back. So... Uh, so that was sort of uh, that was sort of what these credit default swaps are. They're basically insurance. And John Paulson um, that realized that you know, the the housing bubble was about to pop, and he went ahead and bought a ton of these uh, credit default swaps on uh, some of the worst mortgage backed securities. And uh, as we know in hindsight, a lot of the things that were actually rated triple A were not actually triple A. You know, a lot of the underlying mortgages in those triple A mortgage backed securities were actual. Actually, garbage. You know, the actual rubbish. Um, and so, when when you have uh, when you have something that's triple A, yeah, uh, the the insurance on it is very cheap because the risk that they go under is very very low. Uh, so John Paulson was able to buy some extremely cheap uh, insurance on uh, these mortgage backed securities, and he ended up netting netting about four billion dollars for himself personally. Now, this is documented in a great book by itself called The Greatest Trade Ever by Gregory Zuckerman. Which I think you know, all your listeners should read. I think that was a, that was an absolutely insane book. So, and again, it seems like the same uh, same thing, you know, same story, which is uh, courage and conviction, and doing it in size really kind of benefited mm-hmm. here, right? Right, exactly. It's, it's sort yeah. of like you know, it's that sort of like the framework for you know all these trades. Number one, uh, it's usually uh, you know it's very asymmetric, and you know you you usually make it in a lot of size, and you know you end up making a, a ton of money from it. So. Uh, so, you know, that's sort of what is common in all these trades. For sure. Let's uh, wrap up with John Arnold uh, and the natural gas trade of 2006. Mm-hmm. So at the time, Amaranth Advisors was basically this multi-strategy fund that had taken a lot of these, uh, had taken a lot of positions in natural gas. And um, so the guy who trades now, who traded natural gas for Amaranth, his name is Brian Hunter, and he was sort of on the other side of John Arnold's bet. So if John Arnold, uh, John Arnold was long, uh, you know, uh, Brian Hunter would be short and vice versa. And in general, you know, the, in general, these two traders pretty much ran the natural gas market back then. So what ended up happening was that John Arnold, um, uh, so what ended up happening was that in 2006, Brian Hunter made some extremely bad bets. And uh, I'm not aware off the top of my head whether he was long or short, uh, but he made some extremely bad bets. Um, and John Arnold was on the other side of, the stra- of these trades at his uh, at his own hedge fund named Centaurus Fund Management. Um, he uh, he took the other side of these bets, and what ended up happening was that Amaranth Advisors went under. So they had about six billion dollars in management, and uh, they were all dedicated to these bets on natural gas. And none of these bets came good, and you know they ended up losing everything. And in 2006, the collapse of Amaranth Advisors was the largest hedge fund collapse. In history, you know, at that time, so I think that's right. that's sort of what makes the story insane. Number one, the scale of the collapse. So it's the largest hedge fund collapse. Number two, uh, you know, there's a, there's a pretty much just one guy on the other side who's making a lot of money off of this. So that was just John Arnold who made six billion dollars for his fund, 
and he made about $3 billion for himself as well, if I remember correctly. There's a, a good book on this called Hedgehogs by Barbara Dreyfus, I believe. Um, that, that documents this entire story as well. I think that was a, that's another, that's another interesting and exciting book that, you know, I think everyone should read. So, yeah. yeah. You know a lot about these stories. How do you learn about all of them? Like if somebody's at home and they say, hey, I want to learn about, uh, you know, more of the greatest trades in history, what would you suggest they do? So, you know, number one, it's usually, I have sort of a, an obsession with learning about finance. So uh, so that's sort of where, uh, where that comes from. So where the need for me to go and read about these stories comes from. And the second thing is, I think that there's a lot of extremely cool books that are written that, have been written about you know the, about how these uh, trades work. So, for example, I mentioned a couple of them: the greatest trade ever, hedgehogs, and one of the other books that, uh, that that's uh, you know really worth reading is the Sebastian Malaby book, "More Money Than Bot." So, it's usually a combination of reading, being extremely curious, and you know if you read a lot, you're going to stumble on things that you know you never knew existed. You're gonna you're gonna end up stumbling on things that you, know, you never. Uh, you know, that you want to go ahead and research. So, for example, when I was researching about, you know, how currencies work, I stumbled on the, uh, on Soros breaking the Bank of England. So, and then I went on to read a lot more about it. So, I read pretty much everything I could, you know, all the stories, especially number one, it's really interesting, you know, it's such a large amount of money that's involved. That's one thing that attracts me to it. The other thing that, the other thing is, you know, I'm a huge fan of people like Stanley Druckenmiller, who, who is one of the greatest investors of all time. So, um, that's sort of uh, that's sort of what it drives me. And you know, if people want to read more about them, you know, you could just uh, you could simply Google them. You could end up, um, you, know, you, could, you could read several books about them. I, I mentioned about three books. Uh, and, you know, Michael Lewis is another uh, is another amazing author. Uh, and you know, there was a, there was a comment about Michael Lewis the other day uh, that if Michael Lewis wrote a book about the history of the stapler, I would read it. And uh, <laughs> And I think you know that, that's what make, uh, that's what makes Michael Lewis so good. He's a really really good storyteller. And so uh, the Big Shot is an amazing book. Liar's Poker is an amazing book. You know they're both by Michael Lewis. So I think you know he's another awesome guy that you should check out. Yeah, I uh, I think that uh, that is very very true. Um, what's the biggest takeaways that you've had? So you've done probably more reading on finance than most people who are you know two three times your age. What are the takeaways uh, that you could kind of just tell people, hey, after all this reading, here's, you know, two or three things uh, that is just a repeating pattern in every story? Yeah, so uh, so one thing is that pretty much every single, you know, successful trader has uh, simply avoided or, or, you know, investor has simply avoided things that they don't know a lot about. So they've pretty much stuck to their strategy. They've stuck to what they know. They've been very, very, you know, keen on cutting losses. And, you know, when you're wrong, you, know, you just get out of the trade as soon as you know that you're wrong. And similarly, you know, cutting losses is a key part of, you know, being a successful investor. That's another thing that I've noticed. Uh, the third thing is, you know, they all sort of have an obsession with finance. It sort of takes over your life. And, you know, that's uh, that's something that you spend doing, you know, that's that's something you spend uh, most of your day doing. So, for example, Warren Buffett, he said he spends uh, most of the day reading annual reports and, and I think that's true for people like Soros and Druckenmiller and you know Paul Tudor Jones and whatnot. You know these successful traders they have an obsession with finance and it sort of takes over their life. They, they spend they spend a lot of time doing it. They're very invested in uh, you know in learning about uh, finance and you know I think that's sort of that's sort of the hallmark of what makes these people great. So they stick to what they know. They cut. Um, they cut their losses quickly and you know, they have an obsession or a passion for it. So I guess that those are the three main takeaways. Yeah, it's uh, it's absolutely fascinating how uh, the obsession turns into uh, this thing that drives them uh, to just find the trade. It almost feels like in some weird way, uh, it's not the money, right? It's not the profit. That's just the scoreboard. They're really just looking to uh, to understand what's that structural uh, mispricing and then go mm-hmm. and, uh, and exploit it. And then the uh, the profit merely just tells them, yes, you were right in some weird way. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. You know, that's, yeah. Awesome. Uh, well, listen, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. These stories are amazing. You'll have to come back and tell us more uh, in the future. But where can people find you on the internet uh, or where can they listen to your podcast? Absolutely. So uh, I've got a YouTube channel. So if you just search up my name, you know, Shravats and Prakash, S R I V A T S A N, and then space B R A K A S H, uh, you know, you can find my uh, YouTube. Uh, on Twitter, you can find me at Ali underscore investor. 
And then, uh, you know, you can check out my podcast. You could just, you know, type market champions into your search bar and you'll probably find it. So, yeah. The, uh, the Twitter handle at elite underscore investor has got to be one of my favorites that I've seen out there. So uh, I don't know why you chose that one, but that's a pretty good one. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Well, listen, thank you so much for doing this, Srivatsan, and we'll have to do it again in the future. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. It's awesome speaking to you.